Good evening. I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, it's a pleasant surprise to see this big a turnout. Uh, we're happy to have uh, Rabbi Levi with us tonight to talk. He'll be speaking for a while and then uh, take any questions anybody has. Um, the, uh, the lesson, I hope everybody found value in the lesson that we did this time uh, with uh, this book on the Jewish roots of the Eucharist. It was a little different format than we've used before. We're again, we'll have sessions starting in the fall again and uh, would welcome any suggestions anybody has for uh, topics. Um, right now, nothing has been selected and uh, that will be a work in progress. So if anybody has any suggestions, we'd welcome them. With that said, let's pray a minute. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us here tonight for this study and for the information that you've imparted to us. Help us to learn to discern your word, to be better stewards of your word, and to exercise your love with those around us and in the community. Guide us in all that we do. We ask this in your name. Amen. I'd like to introduce uh, Sharon Clayton, who is going to introduce Rabbi Levi. Well, I am pleased to see so many people here. Thank you for coming. When we started on this journey with this book, we found as the weeks went by, there were more and more questions, uh, in particular questions about Judaism. So it dawned on me that the way to find those answers is to find a rabbi who would be willing to come and speak to us. And I'm fortunate enough that there's one that lives right here in our neighborhood. And so I asked, and he was kind enough to accept the invitation. He is Rabbi Eugene, goes by Gene Levy. He was born in El Paso, Texas. He met his wife, Bobby, who's been a friend of mine for quite some time. And in 2025, they will have been married 60 years? 55, 55 years. They have three children and two grandchildren. Hey, my memory's not too bad. Um, <clears throat> from El Paso, somehow, he ended up at the University of Texas, and he received his bachelor's in arts and Hebrew letters. And then he went on to the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Cincinnati or in New York, in Cincinnati, okay? Um, and he... Re he uh, graduated from there in 1972, and in 1997, he was awarded an honorary um, Doctor of Divinity from the same school. He's had a number of positions over the years. One was the director of B'nai B'rith, Hillel? I don't know how to pronounce these, I'm sorry, at the University of Oklahoma in Norman. Then he went on to Tyler, Texas, where he was a rabbi of the congregation there. And then last, the congregation, right up the street, and he retired there in 2011. He is a published author, having uh, written a number of articles for the Purim edition of Shema magazine, and Shema means to hear in Hebrew. He has written uh, High Holiday Sermons, which is printed in the American Rabbi. And I was particularly interested in this one. He worked with, inter with national interfaith organizations on a book teaching Judaism and Christianity to primary grade students. He also has written How We Celebrate, which is the name of a program involving mainline uh, congregations, and that was published in 1991. He has a 2015 memoir, and it is entitled Privileged Encounter, my unique experience with President Bill Clinton from 1987 to 2000. He has a number of honors. I'd be here a lot longer to uh, list all of them. Every place that he's lived, he's been involved with the community in, in various ways. So it's been my privilege and my honor to invite Rabbi Levi.
Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate that. I wish my late mother-in-law had been here to hear that introduction. <laughs> but her daughter, my wife Bobby, is here. So uh, Bobby knows a few of you here. And uh, as I look around, uh, I see some, a lot of interesting faces. So uh, we're going to get started. I always like to start with something kind of funny, maybe, you know, to break the ice. And uh, one of my favorite stories concerns a rabbi, Eric Yaffe, I remember the name, uh, from years ago. And he had just become the, the president of a national organization called the Union for Reform Judaism, which is the lay organization to which the temple here belongs. And uh, many of the reform congregations around the country belong to that. And he had just become the president of that, and he, uh, as president, he had the privilege of going to some of the, the major cathedrals, major churches of various denominations. He was very much an interfaith person, so he had gone to, like, one of the leading Methodist churches in the entire country. He had gone to the Catholic cathedral, I think the cathedral in New York City. Maybe it was Washington, I forgot. He had gone to... Um, uh, the Lutheran, the, the head of the Lutheran church, but the one that he had not yet gone to was the Episcopal church. I know some of you here probably have Episcopal roots, either above you or below you, and and um, he was meeting with the with the rector there uh, about you know what's going on, and the rector invited him to give a sermon, like six weeks from this coming Sunday. Oh, it was. That was amazing. I mean, it was the leading Episcopal church in the entire country. I think it's Wall Street. I think it's called Wall Street Episcopal. And, and so um, Rabbi uh, Yaffe prepared for it, and he was told by the rector, he said, one thing we do interesting here, and some churches do, when you come out, before you start your speech, you say, uh, peace be with you. And the congregation returns with the, with the response, what? And also with you. And Rabbi Yaffe thought that was really cool. He had never really heard, you know, we talk about peace and shalom all the time, but he had never really heard that as an opening response. So he wanted to make sure, he said, he wanted to make sure he got that right. He said, so I'm going to come out and I'm going to get to the podium, and I'm going to look out to the congregation, and I'm going to say, peace be with you, and they're going to come back and say, and also with you. And, and, and the rector said, that's exactly right. Well, comes that particular Sunday, and the rabbi had forgotten that the rector was about six foot five, and the rabbi was about five foot six. So as he gets onto the pulpit and he sees about 500 people out there and the microphone is up here, he brings the microphone down and as he does, he drops it and it rattles around and he says, oh my God, there's something wrong with this microphone and everybody yells out, and also with you. So it was such, you know, a learned response that it didn't matter what he said, they were going to respond it also with you. I thought what I would start with uh, tonight um, is, is kind of an interesting confluence of our two holidays of Easter and Passover. Since you're dealing with the Eucharist and, and a lot of that is part of, of Easter. Uh, and the, the introduction to this is kind of unique because four or five people already have come to me uh, since the end of March and said, well, how was your Passover? And I said, well, we haven't had it yet. And they said, well, you have to because Easter Sunday always comes right around Passover. So I had to explain, and I'll, and I'll explain to you all uh, as, as I can, why this, this particular year, uh, the, the holidays were about a month apart instead of Easter Sunday being the Sunday in the week of Passover. Um, and I think we'll, I'll start it with a, with a story because I think you may come to appreciate it. Um, do any of you remember a, a man who was a member of the temple? His name was Harvey Luber. 
Did any of you know him? He was kind of a jolly Tevye type person, and he was one of the ones who would always lead our um, uh, vacation Bible school visitors. If they were coming during, usually vacation Bible school was in June, and there would be a group of third graders or fourth graders coming from neighborhood churches, and, and Harvey Luber was asked to kind of take them to the sanctuary and explain, you know, the accoutrement, the holidays, the Torah, get out the, the sacred Torah and show it to them and answer questions. And he was talking, this was, this was in the summer, so it's June, I guess, and the kids are, are having a hard time realizing that Jewish holidays uh, begin in the evening and go through the next day, and that the new year, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, start in the fall. And the kids said, that's a stupid time for the, hol- for, for the new year. New year is January 1st. So Harvey said, okay, we're going to go through it like this. Now remember, they're eight, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, and he said, okay. He said, tell me when New Year's Day is. And they'll say, oh, January 1st. Great. And when is, when is Valentine's Day? Oh, they all knew. February 14th. And when is St. Patrick's Day? March the 17th. He was really surprised that they knew all of it. When is Memorial Day? Last Monday in May. Got it. And what about July 4th? Uh, usually on the 4th of July, it was July 4th. And then what, what about um, Labor Day? The kids knew Labor Day, you know, so first Monday in, in September. What about, thank, what about Halloween? October 31st. The kids got it. Thanksgiving, fourth Thursday in November. Christmas, everybody, December 25th. And then he said Easter. And they go, uh, March the 20th, to April the 5th, uh, April. When is Easter? When is Easter? When is Easter? And the minister didn't know either when Easter was the following year because it changes, right? Finally, one of the kids raised his hand and said, I know it's a Sunday. (laughs) To which Harvey said, yeah, Easter Sunday normally does come on a Sunday, but what's the date? And of course, nobody knew because, what, why? It's on a lunar calendar, and it's based on the moon rather than on the sun. So Easter is always a Sunday, but this year, when was it? The end of March. When is it going to be next year? Around the third week of April. Then it's going to be around the second week of April. Then the first, and it's going to, it's, it's within a, a period, but it rotates. And it's never the same date. It's always the same day of the week. So, normally, normally, Easter Sunday is the Sunday within Passover. So, if it were this year, if, if, if that were happening this year, Passover begins next Monday night, the 22nd of April, and Easter would have been the 28th or the 29th of April, which is too late on the calendar. So what happens on the Jewish calendar is that every, seven times every 19 years, or approximately every three years, we have what's called a leap year. Not a leap day, like February 29th, but a leap, a leap, actually a leap month. And we insert an extra month in the calendar so that it pushes the holidays back each year, and then they go forward, because we're on a lunar calendar. Uh, we can explain it this way. Are any of you familiar with Ramadan, the holiday of Ramadan, which just finished, like, last week? Ramadan can be in the fall can be in the summer, can be in the spring, it can be in the winter. Isn't that strange? No, it's not a seasonal holiday. Every holiday that we celebrate, that you celebrate and we celebrate, is a seasonal holiday. Can you imagine celebrating Christmas in September? Well, the stores do, but I'm talking about you. <laughs> can you imagine celebrating Easter in July? Or, you know, or... Uh, uh, whatever, you know, uh, labor, labor Day in December. So all the holidays that we celebrate are seasonal. Ramadan can go, around the, can go around the calendar because it's on a lunar calendar, which is what? 11 days shorter than the solar calendar. So every year begins 11 days earlier than the year before. Same with Rosh Hashanah. 
same with the Jewish calendar, except that our holidays have to be seasonal. Okay, so we can have uh, our new year starting the middle of October, then it can move to the beginning of October, it can move to the end of September, the middle of September, the beginning, but it can't move, be, there's a certain window which it can't come before or after, and if it looks like it's going that way, then the extra month is set in to push it back, okay? So this year happened to be one of those years. So Passover, from my friends who said, well, how was it, thinking it was the Sunday around, uh, the, the week around Easter Sunday, when I told them it's the end of April, they wondered, how is that possible? And I explained, we had, this is one of the years where an extra month has been put in to push Passover back to the spring. Otherwise, if it had been March 22nd or 3rd, the following year would have been March 11th, then March 1st, then February 15th, and pretty soon we would have Passover in December. It's got to be a it's got to be a spring holiday. It's the first uh, it's the first full moon in the, after the spring equinox. So it's lunar. That's why the holidays are separate or different. And so next year, Passover and Easter will come out around the same time. Easter will always be the Sunday in Passover until the next time that we have a leap year where Easter moves forward, Passover moves back, and then the following year they'll join in again. Now, anybody want to repeat that to me? Okay. Okay. So what's the difference between the two holidays? Um, there's, I mean, we could spend the, the whole night on this, and I know you have some questions, but just basically I wanted to, to, to I guess, correct a couple of misconceptions. I call them myth myth conceptions because quite often they're based on on myth one of them is that jesus did not institute the passover the passover had been going on 1500 years before jesus was born jesus and his and it's possible his cadre around him his followers his apostles his disciples reinterpreted it to center around him but the holiday itself, celebrating the exodus from Egypt, uh, about 1400 BCE, has been a holiday since the book of Exodus. And I know a lot of people say, well, I take the Bible literally, except the parts that I don't. Uh, well, you know, those who say they take the Bible literally really need to go back to Exodus chapters 10, 11, 12, 15 in there, 20 is when the Ten Commandments are given, and realize all the, all the commandments for how to celebrate the Passover are given in, the, in, that, in that chapter, in those verses. So the holiday had been celebrated uh, in a specific way up until, and, and Jesus, I think, and his, and his um, followers were celebrating or getting ready to celebrate. I still don't believe, and I've been reading and reading, I still don't believe that the Last Supper was actually a Seder, a Passover Seder, because they talk about the bread and the, and the blood, and Passover is not about bread and blood, it's about matzah and wine, which have nothing to do with a person's body. It has to do with the commandment to remember that God took you out of Egypt and you didn't have enough time to let the bread rise. You know, they say bread is kind of like, um, you know, what, ha what happens to bread when you eat it? It, it? It's like the sun, right? The sun rises in the yeast and sets in the, in the waste. Um, so, but, but Passover matzah can't rise. It's got to be flat. It's got to be unleavened and specifically guarded uh, if you're very orthodox, guarded by various rabbis to make sure that no water gets involved, there's no leavening in it at all. And it's a representation of the exodus from Egypt. So you eat the matzah, you eat the, the matzah along with, and this is a biblical commandment, along with the bitter herbs. And the bitter herbs are a reminder of slavery. 
that the, Egypt, that the Jews escaped from Egyptian slavery. And because Passover is, I guess you'd call it an existential type of holiday because you're, you're ingesting it, you're eating it, you're living it, you're reliving it. It's not just something that happened in the past, but it's something that says, let my people go for freedom. And of course, without getting into politics, I mean, you can see that in, in Gaza uh, and, the, and the captives and, the, and, the, and those who are those who have been held captive for six months, you can imagine, just imagine their families uh, during Passover when they hear, let my people go. Uh, and, and that's another thing too. Um, in that particular command, and I just, I just learned this a few years ago, or I should have learned it when I was in seminary, but I guess I missed that day. Um, when you see the command that God gives to Moses, let my people go, it doesn't just mean, it doesn't stop there. Does anybody know what the next phrase is in the Bible? Yeah? yeah well, let my people go that they may serve me. So there's a freedom and a responsibility. It's not just let them go willy-nilly, let them go for a reason that they may serve me. So every time you see that phrase in the biblical Exodus story, it's going to have let my people go, and God says that they may serve me, me, me and, and no one else. So it's a holiday that, that uh, is celebrated. Have any of you ever been to a Passover Seder? That, I mean, an authentic one at somebody's home or at the temple or synagogue? Yeah. Um, it's a family holiday, basically. And that holiday is celebrated by more Jews than any other holiday in the calendar, even more than the high holidays, the, the Jewish New Year, the Day of Atonement. And the reason is it's a home holiday. And people have their, their Passover Seder. Now, you can have one at the temple or the synagogue, but it really belongs in the home. It's a home holiday, and you don't have to be a member of a synagogue or a temple to enjoy it. it you know, there's no requirement. You can't have a Seder in your house unless you are a member of the temple or synagogue. That's not, you know, there are people, half the, half the Jewish community in the country is not affiliated with any particular institution but 90% of Jews celebrate Passover. So if you're, even if you're the, you know, you've got third grade math, you realize if less than 50% are members of congregations, but 90% celebrate Passover, then a lot of people who are not members of congregations are celebrating Passover, where? At their home, at their family, their parents, their children, neighbor, good friend. Um, and it's a joyous holiday. Now there's a lot of, uh, reading, and there are a lot of rituals, and, but it's fun. And the idea is there that you are reliving the exodus. You taste the bitterness of slavery with the bitter herb, which is often a horseradish, and it's great if you have sinus congestion in the spring. You know, a little horseradish will clear up those sinuses just like that. Um, so you, you taste the bitterness. And then you taste the sweet, too, the sweetness of freedom. And there's a mixture called charosis, which is a mixture of apples and wine and nuts. Uh, and, and, and you eat that, and then you eat them together. There's a, there's a part of the service where you actually eat them together and you realize you can't really appreciate your freedom if you haven't had some kind of, quote, slavery. If you haven't, you know, been enslaved to something it's hard to appreciate your freedom. Uh, just ask a teenager, right? Um, okay. Uh, so the holiday this year, this particular year, starts on uh, a week from tonight, Monday, Monday the 22nd. And you'll either read or you'll hear that Jews all over the world are celebrating this holiday. And there's going to be a particular emphasis. As I said, I'm not going to get into you know, who's good or who's bad in terms of Israel, Gaza, and all that. But just to think, the, put yourself in the mind of, of the parent of, of somebody who was, who was captured uh, and who is still, you know, uh, six months. 
and you don't know whether, you know, if it's your child or your parent or your friend, you have no idea what happened to them at all. Uh, they're hostage for six months. And just think what that meaning of that, of that phrase is going to be, let my people go that they may serve me, let my family go, what, what's going to happen. And many, many families will have, they already have an extra place at the table where no one sits to kind of usher in Elijah, the prophet. Elijah is, is at least in the Jewish religion, ushers in, will, will usher in the messianic kingdom one of these days. And we kind of are urging Elijah to come, come join our Seder. We, hey, we have an extra place for you. There's wine, there's matzah, there's you know, gefilte fish, there's all kinds, you know, come to our Seder. And all, all Seders have an extra place for Elijah. This year, many of them will have a second extra place representing uh, symbolic of the hostages that are missing from the family Seder. Okay, so um, let me go to a couple of the questions that you all have come up with. One of them was how do they celebrate Passover? How do we celebrate Passover? So we've already dealt with that one. Um, I'll, I'll cover these briefly and then see if there are any other questions or, or statements or follow-ups or, you know, or, or uh, designations. Oops, somebody left something up here. Okay. So one of the questions was what happened to the practice of Judaism after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD? Uh, basically, that was the destruction of the second temple. There were two temples. One was destroyed by the Babylonians uh, in 586 uh, before the Common Era or BC, before uh, Christian Era, before Christ. And then one was 70 of the Common Era that was destroyed by the Romans. And from that point until 1948, when the state of Israel was declared, Jews were basically homeless and lived in dispersed areas, many in Europe, um, many in, uh, in, the cent in Central Europe, uh, many in uh, France, in Spain, Italy, uh, some in South America, but Europe became the repository for the Jewish community and that's where it grew and thrived um, uh, with, with pockets that were in Israel, had been in Israel all these years, or Palestine as it was then. And then in 1948, when the state was declared, um, m many folks made what's called Aliyah. Aliyah is a Hebrew word meaning to go up. And so they spiritually went up and moved to Israel. And there are many, many Jews who feel that you can only live a Jewish life in Israel, that because that's where the commandments were given, that's where you know God is closest because of the wall of the of Jerusalem and the wall. Um, so you know, the, if you believe it, you can. You know, many people have moved there. Many people have said, no, 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 no. You, you know, we can have Judaism in in New York, in Little Rock, you know, and even in Conway. Um, and, uh, and BB, uh, there are Jewish pockets. Um, that leads to a question about the term synagogue and temple that, that some of you have had. Uh, be, but it's kind of complicated, but basically every, every Jewish congregation is a synagogue. That's what it is. Reformed Jews have called theirs since about the 1850s, have called their synagogues temples to kind of show and explain that they don't just, that we don't believe that there's just one temple, the temple in Jerusalem. Folks who are more orthodox and who refuse to call their synagogue temple, they call them synagogue or congregation or, or just a, a Hebrew name without the word congregation at all, are more likely to believe, no, there's just one. If you're going to call it temple, it's the temple in Jerusalem, which will be rebuilt, and, and that's where the Messiah will come. Uh, Reformed Jews say, no, nope, there can be a temple in Little Rock, there can be a temple in Chicago. So if you, how many of you remember the yellow pages of the phone book? <laughs> that shows the age of our group here, right? My son had a phone book, saw a phone book one time, and had a picture on Facebook. What is this? 
You know, the kids are all used to directories and everything is in the cell phone. But if you were to have gone to a, to a, a new community and you wanted to go to a temple, a reformed congregation, you would not look up, you would not look up temple in the phone book. You'd look up synagogue. And then under that, if it says temple so-and-so, then you'd know that that was a reformed congregation. If it said such and such synagogue or congregation such and such, you'd know it'd be more traditional, conservative or orthodox. So that, may, that answers one of those questions as to what's the difference. And if people say, if you run into Jewish friends and they say they're members of the temple, then that's the one right here on Rodney Parham, uh, Temple B'nai Israel. If they say we go to the synagogue, then that's the, that's the one over by Red Lobster. Interesting that synagogue and lobster would be in the same phrase, but uh, it's the one behind the Red Lobster, not in Red Lobster, but behind. Um, okay. Um, could you describe a weekly Sabbath service? No. Oh, yes, I can. Um, in, in general, it's a, it's a service... The more orthodox the service, the more conservative, the more traditional the service, the more it focuses on, on you and God. You and God. What do I need to do? Praise, do this. Praise, do this. Praise. And the more moderate to reform, it more, becomes more, horiz more horizontal. How do we treat our fellow men? What does God want of us here on earth? How do we make the world a better place to live? So the prayers will vary depending on where you are. There'll be a certain order. There'll be a certain, uh, some prayers are in every service, uh, acknowledging the one God. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, from Deuteronomy. But the English readings will vary depending on whether it's more reform or more orthodox. Um, when a young man feels that he is called to be a rabbi, what's the process? Uh, interesting question, but it's also now young woman. Because since the year 2009, which is 15 years ago, there have been more women ordained as rabbis in the reform movement than there have been men. Okay? More women than men. Uh, it's become a very comfortable uh, arena for Jewish women and less and less comfortable for the Jewish men. So if you go to a convention, if I were to go to a convention right now and look out, I would have said, you know, 25 years ago, all the women here would be the wives of the rabbis. I said if I were to go in 2020, 24, I look out, most of the would be rab most of the women would be rabbis. That's why they're there, and some of them may be married to rabbis. Some of them married to lay people, but uh, rabbis are now men as and in many professions. Right? Maybe not the Catholic priesthood yet. Probably coming one of these days. But doctors, nurses, doctors, lawyers, accountants. I mean, women have really yes. Oh, 1972, uh, the year of my ordination, we had the first woman rabbi who was ordained. Her name was Sally Prezand, and she just retired a couple of years ago. She's in New Jersey. So we had, we had 35 men and one woman. And in 2009, they had, from the Cincinnati school, 14 women and nine men. So these days, it's about two-thirds, one-third, women and men. Yes, yes. No, it just it didn't happen. It was like, you know, did women in medical school or women in dental school. It just, I think it was maybe the woman's movement from the late 60s and into the 70s that women realized that they could do as, <laughs> as well as men, if not better. And uh, the, le the leadership, I'll, I'll, give you an, I'll give you an example of this. this uh, the, one of my good friends is a rabbi in, in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, he's probably 
55 or so right now. When he was about 30 years ago, he was a, um, a, a, an intern, a, rab a rabbi, a rabbinic student. He was a student in rabbinic school, and he was interning in a congregation in Santa Barbara, California. And he was starting in September. He was taking a year to do his internship. And the, um, the, woman, the, 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 the rabbi he was working with was a, wo a, a woman rabbi. And they said, and the, oh, and the, and the, 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 the rabbi was a, a, a woman, the cantor, the singer was a woman, the head of the religious school was a woman, and the president of the congregation was a woman. And they're introducing Rabbi Brian, Rubenstein, uh, Brian Zimmerman as the new intern, and one of the kids said, you mean they have men rabbis? <laughs> because they're, they're um, um, sphere of influence from the time they grew up was all women leadership. This was in the 1990s. So, um, I mean, to have, to, you know, just imagine, you know, women as the head of every, you know, not just the sisterhood or the council of women, but in, in absolute leadership of, of the congregation from the, from the clergy part on down to the education part. Yes. I just think because of the of the of the um, the numbers, and 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 I don't know because I haven't been I'm not involved with the schooling anymore. Uh, I just think that that men are finding different outlets. Jewish men are finding you know in a lot of them in tech, technical uh, the technical area. Uh, few of Fewer and fewer men are going into the rabbinate. Um, the school in Cincinnati, where I went, uh, is closing. Is closing. Uh, there's still a school in New York and in, in, in California and Israel, but the, rabbi, the rabbinic school is closing. And, and the, the main, the main line where, where it, Reform Judaism got started, they're closing the rabbinic school. Just they don't have enough enough students there. Okay. Yes. You have to pray. Pray for more rabbis. Okay. I'll let you all pray for more rabbis. I, I've had enough rabbis in my life. Okay. Um, the length, the, the the process of study, is uh, five years of graduate school after four years of of undergraduate. So you have nine years of college. Um, and then people are supposed to be smart after that. Um, written documents used in Jewish teachings. The, the main document is the, called the Torah, which is the five books of Moses uh, in Hebrew. If you've been to a Jewish synagogue, you'll notice the ark in the middle of the, of the uh, pulpit. And within the ark are, is at least one, if not two, three, four scrolls. And in the scroll of the five books, the first five books of the, of the Bible, uh, as one of the kids in our Sunday school said, as he was asked to, to enumerate them, he said, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuterectomy. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, God, the rabbis who edited the Torah, that would have been great. This is much too long. We need to give it a deuterectomy and cut it off right here. Cut it off right here. Um, so, and then all the other writings, the Talmud and commentary, everything is based on the Torah because the Torah doesn't tell you everything. It may say, to give you an example, um, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. You know that phrase from Deuteronomy. Uh, and these words which I command you this day, you, should, you shall repeat when you what? When you lie down and when you rise up. What about the question, what if you're a night watchman? Do you recite the lying down prayer or do you recite the rising up prayer? Because you're up when everybody else is down and you're down when everybody else is up. Oh, well, let's look and do it. Well, it doesn't tell you that. It just says you recite these words when you lie down and when you rise up. So... Over the years, the rabbi said, well, if you're a night watchman, this is the prayer you would do. And if you were, you know, you'd do this in the morning and you'd do this in the evening. 
And a lot of the whys and wherefores and whens, the who, what, when, where, and how, were done in commentaries over the years because not everything is in the Torah at all. Um, what happens to the body and soul of a Jewish person at death? Probably the same thing that happens to somebody who's not Jewish. I mean, the, the, we think that the body, um, whether you do cremation or, or burial, the body returns to the dust as it was, according to the tradition, and the soul hopefully returns to God, whatever your God concept is. Uh, that's, I mean, there are all kinds of variations of that, but that's basically the, the, the teaching that, uh, and, and you know, if you want to be cynical about it, you say, I don't know. I don't know where, the, you know, where somebody's soul actually goes. You don't see a soul. A soul is non-material, right? Just kind of like light. You know, if I turn off the light here and it gets dark in here, somebody says, where did the light go? Let's, let's, go, catch, let's go catch the light and bring it back. Well, it diffuses, right? And the soul, we feel, kind of diffuses into God. And, and, and it's a hope. A lot of it is a hope and a prayer. And uh, we try to give comfort to our congregants by using that hope uh, that, that we share with them. Okay, well, we've gone uh, about 45 minutes or so. Uh, so I thought maybe we'd take some questions and I can expand on some of these or whatever you've come up with, um, either from your text or uh, outside the text. So I know it's difficult to ask the first question, so who has the second question? Okay, yes. Oh, you do the first one, okay. Absolutely, I love it. Sure. Mm hmm Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. Right. Three times a year. Okay, the, the bread, uh, it's really hard to know exactly because what we'd have to do is say, look, imagine the tab, imagine you're on the Exodus, okay? Imagine you're one of the people in the Exodus. Uh, from the, it's the whole second half of the book of, of Exodus is, is the, the building of this tabernacle. If you look really carefully, and this shows kind of a cynical side of mine, but I really believe this, the description of that particular tabernacle with its rituals that they have doesn't fit in a desert situation. If you're a scout, how many of you have been Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts? and you're going through the desert, you don't really have time to set up what, what, they, what, what is described in Exodus 27, 28, 29, 30. What I think that is is a representation of the temple that they built once they got to Jerusalem and they needed a, justific a religious justification for it, so they wrote it back into the Exodus story as though God said, this is what I want you to do. I can't imagine God saying, I want 15 yards of crimson, 20 yards of silver, 30 yards, the posts have to be a, a foot and a half high. I, I can't picture a God who is coming up with, with details that an archeologist, that a, that a uh, not an archeologist, an, uh, an architect, that's, uh, thank you, that an architect comes up with. I can't. I mean, looking through it with my, the eyes that I that I have, um, I, I look at the, at this at that whole at the Exodus sanctuary as a model of the sanctuary that they built in Jerusalem. Now, as for the bread, you have to 
be able to plant. You have, you know, you don't just get bread out of the earth, okay? So the bread's got to come from somewhere. And I'm not sure that they actually had, that's why they have the matzah uh, for the Passover, because they really didn't have the time for the bread to rise. They, 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 weren't, they weren't settled farmers. So much of what you see in Exodus and the rest of the Torah seems to show a settled group, a group that's already settled down, that they've set up their tent, uh, that, uh, they've set up their, their community, they've set up their sanctuary, they've set up their, their altar, things that you don't do if you're moving from point A to point B to point C on an exodus. So the bread, I think, is bread that is grown, but it's already, they've already settled in, the, in Jerusalem, and they're, they're thanking God for the, the bread. Bread is the symbol of life. So that's, maybe that'll give you a whole new way of looking at the book of Exodus when you look at it. It's really, it's a fascinating book. And the book of Numbers, too. Because in the, one, one second, I'm going to get to you. How many years were they in the desert? How do we know that? Okay. This is fascinating to me, and I'm not saying it wasn't 40, but 40, for, by the way, 40, if you have a religious dictionary or a, relig a dictionary or an encyclopedia of religion, look up 40. Does anybody know what the definition of 40 is? A long period of time. It's not necessarily 4 times 10, 20 times 2, you know, uh, 40 times 1. It's a long time. That's why there's everything is 40 years, 40 days, 40 nights. Why not 39? Why not 41? Why is everything 40? Because 40 doesn't mean 40 necessarily. It means a long, a long time. So the first year of the Exodus, it takes two books of the Torah to cover one year. From the middle of the book of Exodus to the middle of the book of Numbers, which is 40% of the Torah, is the first year of the wanderings. Can you imagine that much time given to every other year? Second year, third. Now, then you go to the 20th chapter of Numbers and you're already at year 40. So my, ho my homework to you is, my homework for you is, for the next time you meet, go to your Bible, go to the, the Torah part of your Bible, uh, to the second book, to Exodus, and the third book, Leviticus, and the fourth book, Numbers, and tell me what happened in year 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, all the way up. You won't find anything until you get to the 40th year. It's like saying, you know, write a biography of your life or an autobiography, and you say, oh, I was born in such and such, and I lived here, and, you know, you go on and on and on, for the first year, and then all of a sudden you're at, at your 40th birthday. Well, what happened to your teenage years? What happened when you were 20? And I ask the same question, pardon me, I ask the same question often for, about Jesus' life. What was Jesus like as a teenager? Did you ever wonder? I mean, did he have acne? Did he go to the prom? I mean, that, we know about his first year, we know the first couple of years, we know he taught in the synagogue. We think he had a bar mitzvah, the equivalent of a bar mitzvah at age 13, and then he's 33 years old in his last week in Jerusalem. I mean, we have lots and lots and lots of, of stuff about the last week, and the crucifixion and the resurrection and, and John and all the stuff that follows, but we really don't know much about the, the, the middle life, right? And there have been scholars and I wish I could name them, but, I, you know, you always say there have been scholars when you don't know who they are, uh, who have really compared Jesus' life to the life of the Exodus. Because we know so much about, ah, you're shaking your head, good. The first year, of, we know so much about the first year of the Exodus. I mean, it's in great, it's 40% of the Torah is the first year of the Exodus. And we know a lot about the last year, because they crossed the, the sea, and, you know, the, who is like you unto God? And then they go into Jericho. But we don't know much about the intervening years. And the same with Jesus' life. It may have been based on the Exodus, that we know a lot about the first year and the last year, the last week, 
but we don't know much in between. Somebody had a hand up over here, and then we'll come over here. Yes. yes. Um, 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 don't stone me when I leave, please. I don't know. <laughs> my question, question is, is um, um, <laughs> but did the, 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 uh, the uh, Tabernacle, tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant not contain manna, manna from the from desert, desert that, the, that, the, that God They had manna, yeah. The manna. So, so, but manna and bread are very different. Okay. Manna okay. is kind of like oat flakes. You know, like it's like dew, the right. dew that dew, dew. the dew correct, that would correct. drop. But that, but that was, was that that nourished them. That nourished them during the, you know, on the on the Exodus. Right. So, right. That, so that, the, the, the God provided. That God provided that. Yes. No. Years. No doubt about that. Yeah. During the, okay. Yeah. yeah. I guess yeah. that's my yeah. question. Is I understand once they once got, they got to, to, to um, the promised land. Then they then they planted and they right. But for those forty years, they did the manna was from heaven. Right. Right, right, exactly. Oh, oh. And if you'll pardon the pun, I would say in a manner of speaking, you're right, yes. Yes, ma'am. Here's a mic for you. Oh, oh. I was just going to suggest an answer, answer for why we don't know that much about, about Jesus' earlier, earlier years. years. Because he, he didn't meet Matthew, Matthew Mark, 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 and John, John until quite, quite a bit later. later. Right. <laughs> and, and, and those, much of those were written much later, right? Uh, I mean, I... I love, I love the study, and this is a, a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a, um, a move away. But I love the study of Paul. Paul was always one of my favorite characters, and I need to tell you a quick anecdote about about Paul, so that we can. This is, you know, I went to seminary and I read, and I, and I didn't understand Paul until a, a preacher by the name of Fred Craddock. Anybody familiar with that name? He was a Methodist minister. He died about 15 years ago. He came to Tyler, where I was the rabbi, and I went. He, he had a like a three-day uh, talk at the at the ch church there, and the minister invited me to hear it. And Fred Craddock told this story, and I'll and I'll shorten it a little bit. It's the days before computers, so you know it's when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Okay, it's about 1980, and it's a Saturday morning. And it's raining outside, hard, hard rain. And uh, inside a particular home, the, the dad has left for work. He's in, of course, in a suit and tie at the, in those days. Mom is vacuuming the house, like that's what mothers did then. Um, and little Johnny wants to go out and play baseball. And he's already got his, his glove, and he's got his hat, and he's got a shirt, and his sneakers on, and he puts his head up against the window, and the rain is just coming down like crazy. And the mother says to him, Johnny, it's raining outside. Whatever you do, don't go out and jump in the mud. <laughs> oh. Throws the glove down, runs outside, and what does he do? He jumps in the mud. Why does he do that? because his mother told him not to do that. What does that have to do with Paul? So according to Fred Craddock, one of, Paul, one of the things that Paul dealt with was the concept of sin, because so many of the do, thou shalt do in the, in the Bible, we want a thou shalt not do. And all the thou shalt not do, we want a thou shalt do. You all are driving from Little Rock to, to Dallas, Texas. You're on Interstate 30. How many of you have done that? Okay. It says speed limit, 70 miles an hour. You put your governor on 70 miles an hour, as my wife will tell me. And do you pass most of the cars or do most of the cars pass you? 90% of the cars will pass you while you're doing that. But it's against the law. Well, it says thou shalt not drive over 70, and therefore we're going to drive 75 or 77. If it says thou shalt not drive over 75, we're going to drive 82 or 83, okay? To this very day, the thou shalt want us, are causing us to thou shalt not, and our thou shalt nots are causing us to thou shalt, and Paul basically said the law leads to sin. If you incorporate Jesus in your heart, you don't have to worry about the law. Jesus will be the road to salvation, and that's where Paul... That's where Christianity and Judaism kind of diverged because Judaism continued to follow the law, basically, the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots, 
early Christianity tended to follow and say, no, all we need is Jesus. And, and it obviates the whole law. Look at the book of Romans. And then we gain salvation through that. And Judaism and Christianity converge, uh, diverged at that point. And I heard that. I said, I studied Paul for two semesters, and I never learned that. And here the minister gives that one story and the follow-up. And I said, it's all so clear. Now you go back and read Paul, and you'll find that that's what he was, Paul was struggling with uh, when, he met, when he encountered the Christ. He, didn't, he never knew Jesus, but he encountered the Christ on the road to Damascus. I saw another hand there, yes. Um, um, well, I, thought I thought Jesus, Jesus said, said, I, I come, come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill, fulfill it. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I just finished teaching a, a course at the UAMS to some chaplains on the, on the parables. We looked at four parables uh, out of the many. And you come to realize that, that the, the average parable is, has this formula in it. They don't all do, but... The, you have heard it said that, dot, dot, dot. but I come to tell you that plus. It's not don't do that, but it's, you know, I've come, you, you have heard it said, love your, love your neighbor as yourself, but I tell you, not only do you do that, but you also don't hate your neighbor in your heart, and he continues on. That's what got him into trouble with the Pharisees, is that he didn't, he didn't abide by the rabbinic method of telling stories. I love the parables. And we did the, we did the parable of the, of, the, um, of the sheep, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. We did that as a group. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the author of the book we used, Amy Jill Levine, called that, quote, God's lost and found. Right? Because in, they're all lost. And then they're found, and God rejoices. God rejoices over the finding more than he rejoices over the people who are already there. So I love that. God's lost and found. So next time you look at the par those parables, read it through those eyes. Yeah. My question. Oh, no, okay, because then there's another question, question, too. I have a quick question, please. 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 Um, um, as you know, as you know uh, 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 we Christians, Christians see, see a lot of, lot of prefigurements, prefigurements yes. of the Messiah, the Messiah. Yeah. in the in Hebrew Bible, Bible yes. which, which are fulfilled, fulfilled in Jesus. Yes, yeah. Do modern, Do modern Jews, Jews, when they when set they that set empty, empty plate at their, their Seder, Seder suppers, suppers, and they're, and they're waiting, waiting for the Messiah, for the Messiah do, they do they have different, have different indicators, indicators or different yeah. signs? Or different well, they're, okay, they're not actually, okay. It would take us a whole thing to talk about what's the difference in the Messiah. Okay, they're not looking at it as Jesus. They're looking at it as Elijah, who will eventually announce the coming of a messianic age. Maybe led by a Messiah, maybe not. Maybe led just by a cooperative world that we don't have yet. Okay, so in the, in the Haggadah, which is the, which is the book that we look at, there is a specific passage that, that reminds us that it is only God who brought people that, that brought the people out. Moses isn't even mentioned. Moses is not mentioned. He's mentioned in Exodus, but he's not mentioned in the rabbinic Bible that we that, that, that we use. Uh, not rabbinic Bible, but the rabbinic text that we use at the Seder called the Haggadah, and it was purposely done in the first the end of the first century to make sure that we didn't substitute anybody for God. Not Moses, not Jesus, not nobody, okay? Pardon the grammar there. That it was God alone who was the redeemer, okay? And God will send Elijah at the time that God chooses. But we have the table set for him in case he decides to come to our table. There is, there's a place for him. But basically, your, your, your pre-question is and I and I I'm not I want to handle it gingerly. The references that that you see to Jesus in the New Testament are not I mean in the old are not really there. They're not about Jesus. I mean there's not, there's nothing. Okay, you can shoot me if you will. There's literally not not figurative, but literally Jesus is not mentioned at all in the Hebrew Scriptures, at all. Right. 
Now you can say, I believe that this eventually will refer to Jesus. That's terrific, because I've learned you can't argue faith. But in terms of text, if somebody says, I know that Genesis 25-7 refers to Jesus, I say, well, show me. Well, but, but it just, well, it, it refers, to, but where is, it, where is it written? Well, it's not, oh, so then you don't take it literally. There's a comedian, I, I forget who it was, who said, you got to watch the word literal. Those of you who have kids or grandkids, and they say, you know, literal, the, the, the example he used was, it said, my daughter, my teenage daughter, went to the movies with her boyfriend, and my wife and I were left at home, and we weren't sure what we were going to do. We'd seen all the TV shows, so we decided to go to the movie also. And we ended up at the same movie that my daughter was. We didn't know about it, but we did. And my daughter comes back and says at night, Dad, when you came into the theater, I literally died. <laughs> the father says, well, welcome back. <laughs> you literally died? Okay. So they use the word literal without really knowing what the word literal means. It's got to be there. And if, and if you take it on faith, that's great. I love it. I take a lot of things on faith. But if you say the Bible literally says that Jesus da, 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 in the Hebrew, it's not there. Okay? I mean, it was written long before, and it's not about prophecy. It's about text. It's about what's happening, you know, at the time. You're waiting. Yeah, the, the Orthodox, okay, the Orthodox will be waiting a Messiah undefined. Reform will be waiting a Messianic age that we all work together to try to bring. Eventually, originally, the United Nations was supposed to be that. When the United Nations was founded, oh, the Messianic era has, uh, Bolivia is going to agree with Ecuador, is going to agree with Cuba, the United States, you know. Yeah, Russia, right. Yeah, look what's happened over. Yes, ma'am. We need to wrap it up real soon. Uh huh. I think they would both agree that Jesus was a rabbi, which he calls himself rabbi, which means teacher. Um, the parables that he taught all came out of Jewish literature, plus, plus the addition, I tell you. Um, we don't base our religion on Jesus, but we, have, we acknowledge it, that he made an extremely important you know, difference uh, in, in religion. But he is not part of our liturgy. He's part of courses that we, we, I took two courses in New Testament when I was at Hebrew Union College because it's, it's important to know. It's, I mean, that's how I learned a little bit about Paul as well. You can't really understand Christianity if you don't understand Paul, and you can't understand Paul if you don't understand that he had a Jewish background. He was a Pharisee, and he admits it. He says in Galatians and Philippians, I was a Pharisee according to the law. Now, he changed, but he was a Pharisee. Is that was he bad? No. No. Uh, yeah, let's do another. Let's. Um, um, hopefully, hopefully, a, a, a two-part two part if you don't have time. Okay. What happened what to happened the 12, 12 tribes? tribes? What, what, what is the remaining is tribes, tribes of today? today? And the second of all, yeah, I'm not. I think they, that's they, a big they, one. they that's dispersed. They dispersed. <laughs> that's all I can tell you. Uh, uh, and, and the. the the sacrifice, sacrifice of the, of at, the the at the temple, temple. if and if when, and when hopefully, hopefully the temple, the temple is ever rebuilt in Jerusalem, will, 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 will sacrifice. That would be the third temple. The third temple. Yeah. Will, will sacrifices. sacrifices Mac, Mac. Okay, that's what the Orthodox pray. That's what they pray for. They want to re the ultra Orthodox because they're supposed to do all the commandments that are in the Torah. How many commandments are in the Torah? Six hundred and thirteen. Thou shalt and thou shalt not. I mean, just take the book of Leviticus and you find about 150 of them just in that book. You take one portion in Deuteronomy, you find 70 laws in that one, in that one chapter. Thou shalt, and, and they feel that they need to do all of them, but you can't do all of them until the temple is rebuilt.
because a lot of the laws have to do with sacrifice. So they pray for the coming of the Messiah, whoever that may be, and the reestablishment of the temple, which is kind of impossible now. That's the, where the El Aqsa Mosque is. Talk about a, an impending war if we were to start building a temple right there. But that's what they pray for. And, you know, when is it going to happen? Eventually. That's the answer you'll get. We pray for it to happen. And they say in Hebrew, Bim He Rabbi Amenu, quickly in our own day. Well, that could be another 50 years from now, right? Okay. All right. We're going to uh, call it to a close. Uh, thank you for your indulgence. We covered about 800 subjects. And uh, I would be happy to come back again sometime if you don't expel me or excommunicate me and continue. Thank you. All right. Uh, appreciate all of your attention and your questions, and I think that uh, we got some wonderful information, and we thank you again, uh, Rabbi Levi, for, for coming. Um, that'll be it. There's some refreshments over there if somebody would like some. And uh, other than that, we will close this session and uh, end here with a little prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for the interaction and the love displayed tonight. Guide us in our actions. Be with us as we depart to carry with you all that we know and to help others and to help ourselves by following your word. Be with us in all that we do. And we ask this all in your name. Amen. Good night and thank you for coming. <laughs>